with high peaks, a land surrounded by water, a place where houses hang from high cliffs, and a place where the depths of the sea wait to be explored, a land with tunnels where creatures unseen by human eyes lurk in caves and tunnels deep underground, a land of deep valleys, a place squeezed between the mountains and the sea whose beauty and mystery has been carved by the hand of nature and the hand of man. A land of magic and mystery. Guangxi. April, Weizhou Island. Water temperature 20 degrees. Tentacles swaying in the warm waters eager to snatch a meal of tiny invisible plankton. 30,000 years ago, molten lava erupts through the cracks in the seabed. When it cools and hardens, the coral arrives. These coral polyps are tiny, no larger than a grain of sand. Over time, these soft-bodied creatures absorb the water's calcium and carbon dioxide to create a hard layer of armor. Eventually, after hundreds, maybe even thousands of generations, it becomes a coral reef. In time, this coral reef becomes Weizhou Island. Today, Weizhou Island is home to more than 14,000 people. all is not well. An invader is on the march. It's a type of seaweed called gulfweed, and it's a menace to the coral reef. Coral reefs grow very slowly, as little as 2.5 centimeters a year. But gulfweed grows very quickly, as much as a meter, in no time at all. Soon, it engulfs the coral reef, taking all its light. The coral polyps die, and when they do, they stop making the calcium carbonate, and the reef stops growing. This is Weizhou fisherman Su Xiangrong. Even though the fishing season isn't at its peak, he sets out to sea early in the morning. Su is nearly 60 years old, and he's got a large family. Fishing can only support a hand-to-mouth existence. If life's going to get better, he needs another source of income. Although it's a threat to the coral reef, this brown seaweed is rich in minerals and it has many uses. Demand for it is soaring and there's money to be made from it. Su so thinks he can pick tons of the stuff before the typhoon season begins. The gulf weed that grows around Weizhou Island is high quality stuff, but it's quite difficult to harvest. Even a strong and able pick will be hard put together more than 200 kilograms a day. 
39 kilometers north of Weijo Island, there's a lush mangrove swamp. The mangrove blossoms are rich in tannin, and in times gone by, people use these plants to make red dye. Marine botanists are fascinated by the ability of these plants to grow in such salty conditions. Red mangrove is a major species of mangrove tree, and Shengkou Town in Beihai is home to the largest red mangrove swamp in China. Young mangrove trees get off to quite an easy start in life. They stay attached to the mother tree, and she nourishes them until they're big enough to put down roots of their own. That's when life can get difficult. The problem is Northern Bay's tidal system. The difference between high tide and low tide can be as much as seven meters. It's easy for a young mangrove tree to be swept out to sea. But if it finds a good spot on the mudflat, a few hours is all it needs to put down really strong roots. Mangrove swamps are a great place for barnacles to grow. A whole colony of them has taken up residence in this young mangrove tree. But they are in fact a threat to the mangrove trees. Too many of them and the young trees will snap under their weight. The mangrove swamp is also home to thousands of mud crabs. Fisherwoman Sung Shangling has set up a crab fishery here. Barnacles, winkles and oysters are what mud crabs like to eat best of all. It'll take almost a year before they're big enough to sell, and in that time they'll eat a lot of barnacles. Using them as food for the crabs is a way of putting this threat to the mangrove swamp to good use. With the gulf weed gathered in, there's just enough time for a bit of fishing. He baits his nets and casts them into the sea. Although the nooks and crannies of the coral reef are an ideal environment for fish, in the spring they're pretty scarce. But there are plenty of crabs and shrimp, a welcome addition to the family dinner table. Gulfweed grows tall, stretching out for the sunlight streaming in from above. Reaping gulfweed in chest high water is exhausting work. The weeds leave blood red stripes on his arms as if they've cut him. Today he is not on his own, his father is with him. The need to get a move on, however, in season will be coming soon. And when it does, only the gulfweed growing in deep water, safe from the powerful typhoon waves, will survive. He also needs to harvest as much gulfweed from the shallows as he can before it's too late. The gulf weed is spread out on the beach to dry off. When back home, they'll be dried thoroughly and then sold. This is another example of ecology and economy working hand in hand. Clearing the weed helps the coral reef survive and improves the lot of Su and his family. It's mid-July and a strong southwesterly is getting up. It's a bad sign as it means the typhoon is on its way. It's time for the gulf weed to scatter its seeds on the seabed and for the fishing boats to head back to port and hunker down safe from the storm.
for some Xiangming too, it's a race against time. The storm will soon be on them, and she has to get the crab pots out of harm's way. Violent winds and torrential rain hits Shangkou town. The typhoon has arrived. At 7.10 a.m., gale force winds send waves speeding towards the mangrove forest. Everything here is interdependent. The mangrove swamp provides a home for all manner of creatures, and it also provides a livelihood for the fishermen. The coral out in the bay, meanwhile, protects this young volcanic island as the waves break on the reef and lose their power. All is harmony here. People, the sea, animals and plants. The limestone that comes from the coral reefs of China's tropical seas is very young as far as rocks go. These carbonate rocks formed a mere 10,000 years ago, a twinkling of an eye in geological terms. But beyond the mangrove swamps that guard the coastline, there's a vast swathe of northwestern Guangxi made of a carbonate rock that's been around for much, much longer. 100 million years. The Tropic of Cancer passes through central Guangxi, making it a hot, wet province, a place where carbonate rocks erode very quickly. And as the Earth's tectonic plates push against each other, the Earth's crust bulges, turning Guangxi into a land of mountains, mountains hollowed and sculpted by the wind and rain. There's never any shortage of people willing to explore the natural world. Mount Barpen, made of limestone. Ming Meng, a diving coach, is getting ready to take a group of divers down into the lake to explore an underwater cave, Jianlong Cave. Put 10 years ago, Ning Meng worked in the finance department of a company. Today, she's a certified SSI scuba diving instructor. 就首先我们会做一个水下二十四项技巧的考核，所以每个动作我们都要按照规范来做，这样子的指导。but for Ming Meng, there's much more to diving than instructing. There's the greatest challenge of all for a diver, cave diving. Underwater caves are full of mystery. You never know what you're going to find. The main component of rocks like limestone and dolomite is carbonate, a substance that is easily dissolved by water. So, where you have a landscape of carbonate rocks and a lot of rain, you're bound to have a lot of erosion. In Guangxi, that means caves and underground rivers and tunnels. There's a whole hidden world of tunnels and caves under Guangxi. But if you want to explore it, you're going to need your diving kit. Mm. 
，很有可能你是第一个进去的人类，之前没有任何痕迹的，没有什么给自己留下一条引路。The water here is very clear. Ming Meng and her teammate Wei Bo decide to explore. Each oxygen tank has 7.4 liters of compressed air. This is enough to support one person for two hours. All is silent, except for the sound of the respirators. Carefully making their way with a line, down and down they go. The cave narrows. How deep it is, how far it goes back, they have no idea. Cave diving's an extreme sport, and it has a global following. It's risky, but that's all part of the fun, all part of the challenge. It's not like ordinary diving where you're swimming in open water. Cave divers are enclosed, navigating their way through complex systems. There isn't much light, so they have to grope their way forward in the dark. And with just two hours' supply of oxygen in the tanks, there isn't any room for error. Suddenly, there's a disturbance. Sediment floats up, and the clear water turns muddy. But that's the least of their worries. As her teammate is changing his oxygen tanks, something goes wrong with the switch. She helps him fix the switch. It's a tense situation. As their hearts race, their oxygen consumption increases. They could easily run out of air. In the end, Ning Meng decides to abort the operation. Kilometers away at the northern end of the same mountain range, and on the edge of the forest, white-headed langurs enjoy a dew-dappled breakfast, just as they have for tens of thousands of years. It's not easy to survive up in these hills, as up here among the rocks, only the toughest plants grow. However, the white-headed langurs have a digestive system specially adapted to extracting nutrition from the coarse, fibrous leaves of the plants that flourish here. There aren't many white-headed langurs left in the world, but here a thousand of them have made their home. High up on these cliffs, these excellent climbers are safe from predators and hunters. But the extreme environment doesn't just test the survival skills of animals. People make their homes and a living here too. In Chibai Nong Town, Da Hua County, northwest of Guangxi, Tan Chimei is making a bamboo gutter. The small village of Ganfandong in Chibainong lies deep in the mountains. But despite being in the mountains, it's actually 530 meters below sea level, one of the lowest human settlements known to man. Viewed from above, 
This morass of 500 to 1,000 meter high peaks looks like a forest of peaks in a sea of rocks. There's no river here though, nor even a well. That's strange when you consider that Chibai Nong enjoys more than 1,500 millimeters of rain a year. That's as much as Guilin, so there's certainly no shortage of water there. But unlike Guilin, the rocks here are a honeycomb of tunnels. The landscape is just like a sieve. Whenever it rains, the water drains away into countless underwater rivers. So, no matter how much rain there is, it drains into the ground. The key to surviving above ground here lies deep underground. Just a few hundred meters from Tang Chi Mei's house, a spring bubbles from a chasm in the rocks. Ben Fang Dong's six springs are the chief source of drinking water for the village's 16 households. Each household has about 130 square meters of land. This land, however, is little more than gaps between the hard and hostile rocky outcrops. Duan County's Dongmiao town lies on the southeastern edge of the Yunnan Guizhou Plateau, 60 kilometers southeast of Chibai Nong. These are places where you can get access to the water that flows underground. The landscape in Jiangji here is similar to that of Chibai Nong, cast carbonate rock. But because it's low lying, access to water is a little easier. Experts reckon that Chibai Nong's rain drains away into an underground river, a river that flows all the way to Dongmiao. When they're not attending to their crops, Wei and his wife do basketry to make a little extra money. Rocky landscapes that don't hold any rainwater don't provide much good farmland. So, as early as 20 years ago, farmers here started to diversify. The tough plants that thrive here, rattan, bamboo and hemp, are great for making baskets. Somehow it seems that however hard nature can seem, she's always provided something that helps people get by. Man and nature are always in harmony. Guangxi. Amateur explorers Xian Fei and his teammates are making their final preparations. Xian Fei's objective is to go along an underground river at the bottom of the sinkhole and make a record of their findings. This unique type of landscape is called cast. 
Karst sinkholes are formed by the action of rainwater on the carbonate rocks. Over time, water leaches the carbonate from the rocks and creates huge cavities, potholes. These get bigger and bigger until the roof caves in. Seventy eight of the world's best known sinkholes are to be found in China. With their steep cliffs and intricate networks of gullies, tunnels, potholes, and underground rivers, the sinkhole is one of the most complex terrains in the world. Xi'an is now ready. He's going to be the first to get to the bottom of this pothole. At its deepest, the pothole Xianfei is going to attempt is 270 meters. That's as high as a 90-story building. It's a daunting prospect. Very few people can attempt any of the Le Ye Linkor group. In fact, only 30 people have scaled the largest of them, the Da Shu Wei sinkhole. Xian Fei and his friends belong to this elite, intrepid group. They've done nearly all the known potholes around here, but it's not just a spirit of adventure that's brought them here. They've been commissioned by the local government to assess the tourist potential of these beautiful, mysterious potholes. When they're 270 meters down, they're as far as they can go using a single rope. They'll need to tie it to another rope. Everything's going according to plan. Xian Fei gets to the bottom in less than half an hour. They plan to cross an underground river and make a report of what they find. Who knows what secrets lie hidden in the dark depths of these caves? For millions of years, what lay at the bottom of sinkholes was shrouded in mystery. But in the past few years, their secrets have been unveiled. At the bottom of Da Shu Wei lies a unique environment home to strange primeval creatures unknown to science. For example, blind fish and cave salamanders. A huge quantity of water flows through the underground river system beneath these carbonate hills. But the amount of water entirely depends on the water flowing down from above ground. When it's dry, the underground river is shallow and easy to cross. During the rainy season, however, it's much more challenging. And maybe that's one reason why these channels have never been charted. To this day, nobody really knows where the water comes from or where it goes.
One member of the team takes pictures, and the results are simply amazing. Thousands of years of erosion have sculpted and smoothed these stones into stunning, unearthly shapes. It makes the team realize how lucky they are. For most people, these photographs are the closest they'll get. They'll never see them with their own eyes. Qian Fei discovers something odd. So far, the water's been crystal clear, but now it's muddy. What's more, the water level is rising. They have no choice but to get out of the danger zone as quickly as they can. They can only go so far with the equipment they brought with them. They can't take any risks. While these explorers need up-to-date equipment to deal with the rigors of a sinkhole, over on Mount Dayao in central Guangxi, age-old mountaineering equipment still seems to do the trick. To the southwest of Mount Dayao stands Mount Mai Shu. It's famous for its dusting of red gravel, giving it a unique and striking appearance. To Chinese Taoists, it's a sacred peak. Villager Chen Yongjiang is getting ready to go down the cliff face. He's using rock climbing equipment that's been in use for generations. In fact, this wooden oxbow is the very same one his father used in his climbing days. The oxbow is fixed to the chest and a long rope is passed through it. The oxbow helps the climber control the rope. He can use it to let the rope out slowly and stop it from slipping. But why is he braving the cliff face at all? He's looking for a herb that's extremely valuable in Chinese medicine. It's the dendro plant, the famous golden hairpin. Chen isn't picking wild dendrobes, he's collecting wild seeds so he can grow his own high-grade dendro plants. Chen has accumulated a lot of dendrobe seeds over the past six years, and now there's not much left. He uses it very sparingly. A seed that falls on the seedbed can grow into a one centimeter high dendrobium seedling after just two months. Chen 
刚种上去，马上下雨，啊，你管理不好的话，最少要那个烂金，最少百分之五十以上。There's a cave that Chen knows about. It's deep with a high roof, making it ideal for bats. For thousands of years, bat droppings have been accumulating on the floor of the cave. It's now rich in phosphorus and potassium. It's a great fertilizer for dendrobes, especially when mixed with sawdust. Jung has some dendro put by. He's been waiting for it to mature. Now it's ready to be made into a top-grade medicinal tonic, the maple bucket. Dendro has to mature for more than three years before it can be made into maple bucket. He grills it, and when it's cooled down, he wraps it in tissue paper. Just 500 grams of this stuff can fetch tens of thousands of yuan. But now he's run out of wild dendrobe seeds, and that's what's brought him and his uncle up to the mountain. His uncle is, in fact, one of the last gatherers who remembers the days when they climbed the cliffs to pick the flower itself rather than collect the seeds. The first thing Chen has to do is find out where it's hiding. During this season, it's not difficult to spot as the wild dendrobium on the cliff has yellow flowers. Wild dendrobes ripen in the autumn, so that's the time to collect the seeds. Collecting them is a very risky business. Scaling the cliffs and dangling in mid-air is just a hair's breadth away from death. Rong Jia Liang and his wife are on the trail of another treasure deep in Wu Huang Mountain at the western foot of Liao Wan Mountain, 200 kilometers south of Bai Shi Mountain. Guangxi is home to large chinkapin forests. The chinkapin, a type of castanopsis tree, produces soils that are very good at nurturing mushrooms. There's one highly prized mushroom that only grows from the roots of this type of tree. At certain times of the year, some parts of the forest suddenly become carpeted with the red caps of this precious mushroom. A few days ago, Rung found several of these white mushrooms. He was over the moon about his discovery, as the villagers here know that, for them, these white mushrooms herald the arrival of prosperity. For the next week, they'll be scouting the mountain, their eyes peeled. The red mushroom is worth waiting for, and they don't want to miss a single chance.
Once the red caps are open, the mushroom stops growing and it starts to shrivel. They'll be gone in just a few hours, so they have to gather as many as they can as quickly as they can. The arrival of the red mushroom is like manna from heaven in their own backyard. You need to take a lot of care. Don't pull too hard. If you pull the cap off, you'll get a much lower price. Although everybody's excited, they go slowly. Also, they don't want to disturb the mycelium that lurks underground and provides them with this precious bounty. The mushrooms will go bad very quickly, so they need to get a move on. The couple go their separate ways. One carries on picking the red mushroom, while the other takes the fresh mushrooms back to dry them. It takes 36 hours to dry the mushrooms. Drying them locks in the flavor and nutrition, and this results in a top grade product. It's yet another gift from nature. The forest provides the villagers with more than 40,000 kilograms of red mushrooms per year. And Mu Yading village is at the center of the trade in this precious mushroom. 30 households here rely on it. In the forests of northwest Guangxi, it's raining. This year, the rains have come two weeks later than usual. Water gushes from beneath the ground and the little river swells. The underground water brings fish with it too. In the eyes of Wei Jifeng, it's another gift from heaven. Ming Meng goes back to Zhenglong Cave. She learnt a lot from her last experience in the cave. This time, they slow down and take their time. A fantastic underwater world unfolds before their eyes. Abandoned pumping pipes and wooden boats sleep in the dark. It's an ideal training ground for cave diving. Autumn comes round again. Time for Chen Yongjiang to gather wild dendrobium seeds on the cliffs. Once everything is ready, he gets in harness and lowers himself down the cliff. 70 meters down, he finds the wild dendrobium seeds he's been dreaming of. From oceans to land, from mountains to caves, from potholes to cliffs, Guangxi is a land of contrast and mystery. And the people who live here are determined to fathom those mysteries, to find out new things, discover new opportunities. It's that sense of determination that sense of courage which drives these people forward and brings progress to this region. With 80% of the land covered in mountains, 10% underwater and just 10% in farmland, despite its favorable climate, Guangxi is not ideal for farming. So, how do Guangxi people rise to the challenge?